All right. Um, I guess to get us started, I'll do the kind of the case spiel. Thanks to everybody for coming. This is Case, the Chicago Scholar Group. Um, Andy Hamilton, I help organize. Uh, we're always we're keeping going uh, virtual for now, uh, but I do have speakers tentatively lined up through November, and uh, we'll likely take uh, December off, give folks uh, holiday time back. But uh, if anybody is curious about anything coming up in the new year or um, you has, has a topic they'd like to see or would like to give a presentation, always ready to, to put your name on the list and or um, maybe as Chris so uh, nicely did, be, be a backup for us. Uh, Chris uh, helped out uh, kind of last minute minute ad. Uh, so those are always nice to have uh, backups as well. Um, let's see. All right. I think that's about it. Uh, Thanks to, to, to Rally Eyes for using their, their meetup, but they're fine with that. And thanks also to, to Chris for, for presenting. I guess take it away, Chris. Uh, all right, great. Well, so I am Chris Vale. Um, I'm an architect at Rally Health here in San Francisco. Um, and today we're going to have a talk about recursion schemes. Uh, not so much how to use them as what they are mathematically. Um, I'm particularly interested myself in the, the confluence of the math of category theory and the reality of uh, statically typed programming languages and more concretely in the scholar programming language. Um, I've been writing Scala since, actually since Scala 2.9, um, which puts that me, puts me about 2012, 2011, something in that range. Um, and, uh, here we go. So recursion schemes as a concept are remarkably old. Um, they, they first came out in this paper, which is from 1991. Um, I, I do like the title, uh, although I, I have to admit learning where it came from, what it meant, ha had re does have re has reduced the, uh, my, my, uh, my delight, I suppose, in it. Um, it refers to a language that the authors were using to explore functional programming. Um, and it had some neat uh, characters in it to use as operators that uh, had these names. Um, but the, anyway, here what we see is that they go through and they, uh, they're, they're working on trying to describe recursion in functional programming languages, and they, they come up with an idea which still is not widely used in any language that I know of outside of uh, a Haskell. Um, we do have a couple of libraries in Scala, uh, Turtles, which used to be called Matryoshka, and, uh, and Drust, um, neither of which have yet achieved a particularly high level of uh, usage. So today's talk, we're going to start with uh, algebras, specifically F algebras, and we'll take a quick tour of recursive data types. Um, we'll apply some category theory. We'll develop recursion schemes and use that development to derive catamorphisms and anamorphisms. Um, and just to spoil the ending, catamorphism is fold and anamorphism is unfold. Um, whoa, okay. Uh, here we go. So this is this has been a very difficult slide for me. Uh, the mathematical definition is similar to the math the the mathematical definition of a mono as uh, a monoid. Monad, yeah, the monad is a endofunctor, blah, blah, blah. Uh, very, very accurate and completely and utterly useless. 
Um, so we're going to talk about algebras as a part of two things. One is is the type of an expression, and the other is, as you see on the on the right hand side here, uh, basically it's an expression language. Um, there, there's a there's a way you can view this that makes the the goal of a recursion scheme the same as an interpreter in a free monad or a free applicative or a fixed point um, uh, sort of encoding scheme. You know, we, we would write a language that had a bunch of operators. We could parse and unparse that, and then we could evaluate the uh, the data structure that we got out of that to generate answers. Um, generally, because we're functional programmers, the the first thing we should think of, and when we see one of these things, is, oh, you know, I can I can evaluate that with a with a recursive function, um, and then we're going to go on and and see how we can generalize this up uh, into the math, and then bring it back down in a more general form for coding. Um, in in our case, this this specifically is about recursive data types. Recursive data types are important because, first of all, almost all of your data structures are going to be at least have an encoding as recursive data types. And the other is that you don't really need a recursion scheme if you have a non-recursive data type. Uh, so this this is the world's simplest list. It's just cons and nil. Um, everyone uses it because you can write it in three lines of code. Um, the the recursive nature is that cons actually refers to list itself in its own definition. And with that, we can go to the next kind of recursion, which is the structural re recursion. Um, we're just folding over the elements of a list to sum them up or to to multiply them out. Um, at the bottom, you can see where we get to multiply, which takes a list and returns an end. That th these are fold, and fold is the 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 zeroth recursion scheme. However, because we're allowed to refer to ourselves in our def definition, we can build something that's a little bit more complicated than a list. Uh, lists are convenient. You can you could just iterate over a list. That's no problem. Um, you don't have to recurse. There's no trickiness. When you get to something like, in this case, a simple tree, which has leaves and nodes, those nodes contain either a tree or a leaf. Um, and actually, I seem to have missed uh, nil on this to have a, an empty tree and a, and a node, but that's all right. Um, when we get to a structure like this, because it has multiple elements that we have to iterate through, it, it turns out to be more difficult. I mean, you can still write iterative code that that would that would traverse something like this, or in fact, actually would traverse this. Um, it's not, certainly not impossible. Um, in fact, actually, it's not even particularly difficult. But it starts to get complex, and you, and you can see as you go forward that the code to handle, to do something like fold across a tree um, becomes really annoyingly complicated when you get to say, let's say we could have a tree with, with values in the nodes. We could get a, a tree that's more than uh, two subtrees, things like that. The thing is that when we wrote our recursive fold against the tree, it really basically looks exactly like our 
recursive fold against a list. It it ma pattern matches out it, its way out by um, by ta handling each case uh, of the of the type and calling itself where where that's required. Um, it, it's a it's only a very small amount different in the, how it handles the different elements, and so that that brought the authors of our starting paper to the question: Can we make this generic enough so that we can just plug in something from category A and something from category B and maybe something from a category C? Pull a couple of components together and build a generic and general way of traversing these structures. Um, but in the in that simple encoding, the answer really ends up being no. Um, I, I'm convinced that that you could do it, but it would be horrific in in complexity. Um, I've seen some people take runs at it with things like shapeless. Um, trying to to come up with a, a decent way um, maybe some more specific macros would be needed things like that but you end up with a situation where it turns out to not be really possible at all to build a generic structure for saying here I have a I have a th I have a collection a container and it's got stuff in it, and I just want to fold it and and add up all the integers in it. <clears throat> so because, because this comes from academia, the first thing that an academic who's a computer scientist wants to, to do is to is to whip some math on the problem. And the, the kind of math that we use in functional programming is category theory. Um, not real category theory, a branch of computer science that looks a lot like category theory um, and uses many of the same words and concepts. <coughs> so we're, there's a little definition of category theory. You know, category theory is about, about all the things you can do if you have some kind of object, say, 32-bit signed ints, and arrows, which are basically functions. Um, it turns out you can do a remarkably broad range of things if you simply limit yourself to thinking of the types of things that you're doing as, as these objects living in a category and arrows. The thing is that all math problems seem to involve setting up a problem, showing it can't be solved, pulling out a trick, applying that trick, and solving the problem. Um, I don't know why this is. Um, I think I, I think it's to encourage nonlinear thinking. But we're going to pull a trick out to solve this problem. And that trick is going to be, we're going to make our list in this case, we're going to make it a higher kinded type. We're going to add a generic parameter. Um, in this case, the generic parameter is not the type of element that the list contains. The list is still an, a list of ints. It, it's just that it has this magic, and it's, if you look at it, unreferenced generic type parameter. And then we can show that our new list is exactly the same as our old list. Um, for any list f, I can go through and convert it from a list f to a list. And the same with a list. I can convert it from a list to a list f. So they're, they're isomorphic. They're the same thing. 
and as is the nature of this trick, it doesn't appear that 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 that's a particularly interesting thing, except for the fact that what we use to convert them is actually a functor. So basically what we're doing here is we can write a map that goes from list F to list and from list to list F. And here we go, Mr. Functor. Um, not sure what more to say about this. Hopefully it's a thing that you've, you've seen before um, and it ends up being pretty integral to figuring out how to uh, make a, a generic structure traversal that is a, a recursion scheme. And, and now we're gonna start getting to some of the more interesting parts of this. Um, there's this the algebra that we talked about earlier, where the algebra is effectively uh, all of the actual ADT instances that are part of this type. Um, and how we can go from, and as you can see, um, from the type of A to an actual A. Um, and, and now we're, we're working forward. We've got this, this algebra thing, and it's composed of the container, in this case, list F, and the type that's contained in that container, in this case, int. Um, because we're multiplying nil F is one, um, and cons f is in this case. I mean, we're this is this is an evaluator, right? We are evaluating some arbitrary values uh, contained in a list, uh, and we want to multiply them all together. I could have picked some, in which case nil f would have been zero, and the cons case would be h plus i. Um, Interestingly enough, we now have everything we need to solve the problem of going from our container to this generic structure, and we can build what is cat what the catamorphism, which is our first stop of the, the generalized fold. Um, we we can convert from list to list f from list f to f of a via map and then from f of a to a via our algebra which was the actual reducing function and we now as as long as we have a functor and a way to map out of of the original type, we could we could actually skip the the R to RF step, uh, but generally speaking, uh, we want to we want to keep that so that we can start with say a standard Scala list, which is not properly recursive in this type, uh, convert it into something that is the correct kind of recursion, map that recursive type to an algebra, and then evaluate that algebra to get an answer. So that's that's kata here, right? We, we go from list to list F, we go from list F to F of A, and now that we're in algebra land, we can just evaluate our, our, our F to, a, to the A and Bob's your uncle. Um, and there we go. Um, I, there's 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 little or nothing I think of that think that I can say about this more than that. It's it, it's remarkably easy to to get to this step if you know all the intermediate steps. Um, and then once you, you once you're here, 
you can look at this and you can say, well, okay, so, so what kind of structure does this work for? Well, it works for any algebra that I can, I can write as long as I have a functor for that algebra. Um, this is super simple and you can write the actual evaluation here without referencing anything specific about any of those components uh, and the and because the only requirement that you've put on this is that you have an algebra and that algebra has a functor and that's it. Um, I, I find that remarkably interesting that without injecting this really bogus generic parameter into our data structure, really you can't get here from there. Uh, but you but you take that reasonably simple trick and with with a little bit of definitional work and, and one functor, you're you're done. So having having done that, look at that and you can say, well, can can I apply that to some other kind of action? And and it can, you know, the second most common, and it's not very common at all, is unfold. Um, Scala only got an unfold for for uh, 2.13. Um, until then, none of the collections that I'm aware of had an unfold method on them. Um, it's it's range as the use here in in real life. The the case that that I have encountered where I could use an anamorphism. Uh, is taking a stream of values and turning them into a structure. Um, most often, uh, because we use MySQL, but the, the last place I worked, um, and you couldn't really do, you couldn't do sort of ANSI standard recursive uh, queries, you ended up getting a stream of things. And if they formed a, some complex shape, you would have to build it up manually, um, which can be difficult if if you're trying to say fold them into case classes or something. But but this makes it really simple. You you make a shape that is your type. You feed it in a list of values, and you simply ana across it and get out the shape you want. For this, we're going to just use range. Um, it, it is. Very simple. The problem is, is that what we have is we have the the we have the algebra, we we have the in and out. What we don't have is the ability to go in the correct direction. If you notice set up the way we are right now, um, the arrows point that specifically is the algebra arrow points in the wrong way, right? We want to get to F of A. We're starting at R. We can't get there from here. Um, but with the simple flipping and uh, moving from an algebra to a co-algebra, and I don't know, co-whatever is just, the opposite of so where algebra was the actual reducing function, coalgebra is the actual constructing function. Um, and actually, once we get do that, we we have the arrows going in the right direction, and we can 
we can go from values to our structure. Um, right, so algebra is f of a to a, that's our producing function. Coalgebra is, is a to f of a, which is our, effectively it's a type constructor. I mean, it's almost, it's almost pure. The, type, the, the function in, that's part of applicative. Right, so now we can say, we can define Anna for any type and structure where we can have, where we can define a coalgebra and we have the functor. Um, and that's it. Actually, this went much faster than it did the last time. Sorry about that. Um, That's right. Do you want to go back uh, to the last slide a little bit more? I think I went through that one. Okay. Just, yeah, the I mean, range. So, okay. um, you know, if you if you actually have questions, feel free. Um, we can we can talk about this. Um, yeah, this is what I get for having having a a uh, presentation that was tweaked to go into a half hour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this time it actually took a half hour. So, <laughs> um, what what I haven't included and in, and a lot of people are interested in is that um, there are there is there are two libraries. Like I said, Turtles, uh, which is the successor in name to Matryoshka, uh, and is built on Scala Z, and Drust, which is uh, built on cats. Um, Turtles is sadly pretty much dead along with Scala Z. Um, Drust goes forward, it's slow. I, it does not have a large uh, community. I think right now the Scala world visualizes um, recursion schemes as of only of academic interest. Um, but actually, if you look at, if we go back, right, and we look at, at um, where, where was the, okay. So if we go back and look at Kata, and, and you, you look at my encoding here, which is, not actually quite the same as the one in um, Drust, right? But but the core of this is the functor and the algebra, and then some kind of structure that has the data in it that you want. This ends up being exactly, this is literally exactly what you do in Drust to use a recursion scheme. You create an algebra. Uh, you make sure that you have a functor for that algebra. You take some data structure, and usually you have an out, or as it might be called, a lift um, to, uh, to 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 move it to a way to a form in which it can be. Uh, used in the recursion scheme, and, and that's that's really all you write. The rest of it is um, handled by the library for you. Uh, it, it's it's got all the things in it. It doesn't it doesn't stack overflow usually, um, unless they've missed something, which I found one of, but not recently. Um, and and then there are there's anamorphism, but there are a couple of other less common and less well-described morphism, gylomorphism, specifically in histomorphism, which I have yet to come across a use case for, so I am not outrageously familiar with. Um,
anyway, so does it? Does anyone have any um, questions? We can we can do that for a bit. Um, Wait, I, I guess you kind of mentioned at the end that, or towards the end there, that you know you haven't seen a lot of uh, kind of pick up in, in Scala yet of, of drills to, or, or uh, um, is, are there applications where you, th you think it would, this would be good to bring in and use that, that people you just aren't aware of or, or are there other, you think are there other roadblocks that, that are maybe holding it back? So, so I think the biggest, I think there are some roadblocks that are holding it back. And I, and I think they are, um, and, and I've seen this at, at every Scala shop I've worked at, is that being honest, the majority of Scala programmers are Java coders in drag. Um, they, they really are not comfortable with especially the more esoteric elements of functional programming. <laughs> so they they look askance at structural recursion, and they really don't have a good grasp of what it means to do type recursion. Uh, and so these things become almost unreadable to them. And I have yet to really be able to come up with a with an educational plan to, to get them over that. Um, I right now I'm working on this idea that well, if a catamorphism is is effectively the same as a fold, and anamorphism is effectively the same as an unfold, and I can come up with use cases for those. Um, Maybe I can sort of hide some of the more advanced details at the beginning and say, well, you know, we're going to take this stream of values and turn it into a structure, right? Well, so we've got this cool library that will let us do this tricky way of doing that. Um, or we want to do effectively what we want to do as a fold, but we want to do it over a structure that we end up having to build ourselves. Uh, trees are especially the common ones, right? In a lot of cases, we have trees with arbitrary number of sub-elements, um, which can have sub-elements of an arbitrary number, and, and on and on and on. And, and writing generic, generalized code that let you plug function A in for this API call and function B in for that API call, those things can be really difficult. Um, and in fact, pretty near impossible. And so we have a lot of code that just goes, oh, well, I'm just going to do this right here in place, and, and I'll do it the, the, the simple way by just doing it without thinking about generalization. Um, but you know, as we all know, right, the more lines of code you write today is the more lines of code that you're obliged to maintain tomorrow. And what I'm hoping for is to, is to come up with some good um, cases where we end up seeing the value of this in that we've turned several hundred lines of hand-tooled data manipulation into 20 lines of almost incomprehensible code that doesn't seem to do anything but solves the problem quite adequately, um, meaning that we end up not having to maintain all those hundreds of lines of code and the inevitable errors that that slip in when you when you write code, just any code. So, hey, you, you mentioned. Um... It's pretty pretty straightforward to find uses for 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 folds and cat and and cata and stuff. Can you and then also mention that Anna being the dual? Usually, when you have a a a thing and a dual of a thing, one of those is more frequently used than the other, um, which is the case here. Uh, but can you maybe talk about it? Can you think of any other examples of of using Anna other than than maybe range? 
Um, so, like I said, there, there are cases where the, uh, the, the use of, of Anna comes from, you have a, some hopefully finite stream of values um, that you want to build into a, uh, a, a data structure and um, I'm not I'm not sure about how much uh, anyone here other than Andrew potentially knows about rally but one of the things we do is we track uh, our users uh, workouts so they they have a Fitbit or they have an Apple watch or they have an Android device, a Google Watch, they have a phone that goes in their pocket and counts steps. Um, we, we collect those. Um, we treat that as this, almost an event source stream um, of, of events that come in and we turn them into a structure that represents a, a, I mean, basically, it's a summary of how much you've exercised, how frequently, how hard, for how long, those kinds of things, and and those are the that's the case where Anna helps you out, right? In in that case, Anna is actually consuming effectively an infinite stream. That the 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 inflow of fitness data just runs forever and by doing this we can simplify this this building a structure and in this case the structure is uh, a, a bunch of different composite slices of aggregated data about all the, the you know all the views into your fitness data that you could want to have um, that's that's my primary use case for Anna at this point. Um, it, it's pretty specific, um, but really any place where you were doing data engineering slash data science style aggregating data, um, especially if if it effectively looks like your stream is infinite, that is to say, events keep coming in. You're you work for Datadog, and events just keep coming in, and hopefully never stop. <laughs> never stop because, of course, you don't want to run out of business. Um, uh, those are those are the that's the case for for Anna. I mean, it, it's got a it's got a useful case. Um, it's not as common as I have a I have a big structure and I want to reduce it down to some value. Um, but it, but it does have but it does have good usage and and I'm familiar enough with it to t talk about it. I think is the way to. <laughs> I guess I don't want to dominate. Dominate. Anybody else have any any questions? <laughs> All right. Oh, well, okay. Well, thanks, Chris. No, no problem. Um, we'll work out after how to share the deck if you if anybody's interested. Uh, yeah, and I'll I'll uh, post a link to the recording uh, probably tomorrow or maybe this weekend. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Sorry, this was so short. I I took me much longer the last time. <laughs> no, that's correct. <laughs> right. right. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.